Well, fantastic. Thank you all for being here. We've got a really exciting panel um, about AI and banking and how to kind of get started uh, all the way from things like core banking to data platforms. Um, I'm joined by a fantastic um, group of uh, accomplished folks here. So I'm going to go through quick introductions. Maybe Richard, we'll start with you. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Richard Healy. I'm the CIO, CIO of Macquarie Bank, which is retail bank in Australia. Grace. Hi, everyone. Uh, Grace Lee, Scotiabank. Uh, and I lead up uh, data and analytics and AI. Hello, Massimo Proverbio, pleased to be here, uh, responsible for technology, data, and cyber in uh, Intesa San Paolo, an Italian bank. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Sabo Echpaldi. I'm the Discover Financial Services. And uh, amongst other things, I'm responsible for the, uh, the well-being of our customer service agents and the quality of uh, service that they provide. Fantastic. So we're going to start with a couple questions. But as you listen, um, please start to think about questions that you would like to ask um, the panel. And we'll, we'll make time towards the end for, panel, for, for questions from the audience. Um, so starting off uh, with Richard, thinking about kind of getting started. I know a lot of uh, customers in the audience um, are on their cloud journey. But as you think about the very established foundation that you've built, kind of how did you get going? What were some of the key things that you learned as you built kind of the core infrastructure to, to power the, the, the bank? Yeah, if I spend a couple of minutes just uh, explaining our journey, we really started rebuilding the bank back in 2014 putting the big building blocks in place, new core banking, new payments, new originations, new e-banking, new m-banking. <coughs> that was really the building blocks. And then really about 2016, 17, we shifted and decided that we wanted to be 100% public cloud. Um, uh, and we're 96.4 this morning. Um, <laughs> I keep a close eye on, on, on this. Uh, and we have two hyperscalers. Google is clearly one. But we, we, we differentiated those hyperscalers. We wanted a, a hyperscaler to provide uh, uh, infrastructure services, IaaS, simple IaaS. But we wanted Google Cloud to be a cloud uh, of uh, differentiation for us in the relation to digital and data. Um, so we had some really strong engineering principles about what we were going to move to cloud and how we were going to move, but also how we were going to use Google. Um, and th that's been our journey. We've got all of our digital and data services now running on Google Cloud. So anything to use the language of above the glass, below the glass, anything that the customer sees, it sits on Google Cloud. Because we wanted that velocity uh, and speed of capability from Google to be able to serve our customers. Fantastic. I think that last point that you mentioned is really important. I, I, I think a lot of customers think about their data and they sort of think, well, once we get it all in one place, once we get kind of the, the gravity there, uh, everything, the magic will start to happen. But velocity is a really important thing. Speed, um, particularly in the AI world, which we'll get to later, um, that becomes even more important. So Grace, maybe you also have been on a, on a really pretty extensive uh, transformation journey, particularly around the data space that you've done at Scotia. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how you got started on your journey and, and kind of what some of the successful ingredients have been. Yeah, so we, uh, we got started, I think, about seven years ago. And I don't think it's a misstatement to say that we've learned a lot uh, and we had a rocky start. Uh, so I think... Uh, with every mistake comes an opportunity to learn. Uh, and we have probably three things that we've now focused on and built our program around based on those um, missteps. Uh, so the first is taking a much more rational approach to security. Uh, so I think in the early days, everybody was so scared of cloud uh, that we really made protection of data a huge priority. And it should be protected. Let me make sure as I look at my CISO. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I uh, restate that. Uh, but um, I think we were so proud of how secure our data was, and it was so secure that we protected it even from the end user. Uh, so uh, if you think about what data is for, it's for using. Uh, so one of the basic principles that we have uh, for the new cloud program is to make sure that it's usable. And we're in financial services, and we could have zero credit losses if we didn't lend. Uh, but we choose not to do that because lending is our business. 
And, and similarly, we need to accept a certain level of risk um, in, in our data and in, in our technology, and we are. Um, and we're in the business of risk management, not risk prevention. Um, I would say then, extending from that, uh, you know, we, we did the thing that every tech project does, which is if you build it, they will come. And uh, I think many people in the bank didn't even know that we were <laughs> going to cloud. Uh, our technology people did, but nobody else did. And so now we're spending a lot of time engaging the business. Um, and it's made a real difference. It's, it's harder. Uh, but it's made a real difference. And the thing that I think is really great linking one and two is that because we've taken a much more rational approach to security, we have PII enabled in the cloud. We spent a lot of time on that foundation. And I think that the partnership that my CISO and I have is very important because PII is everywhere. And if you want to serve your customer, you have to use PII. Personalization comes from PII. So without that, all this stuff on cloud is just a storage a facility, not a real area to serve your customers and your employees. Um, and then the last thing is we were so scared to move at pace that we kept on POCing everything. And it's really difficult um, to justify your proof and if the proof doesn't lead to anything. Uh, so now uh, we, uh, we're very proud of the fact that we've announced a very large extension of our partnership with Google this Monday. And it was actually announced by our CEO at our AGM on Tuesday. My, one of my board members is actually here uh, to support uh, this initiative as well. It is something that really we have put, we've gone all in. Uh, we have sufficient proof that this works, proof of cloud, POC. Um, and now we're ready to move at pace. We have a migration factory set up for applications and data and we can finally commit to something that we've been talking about for a long time. That's fantastic. Yeah, a lot of lessons there. Massimo, maybe you could talk about kind of the, the, the core banking journey that you've been on and some of the work that you've been doing around that foundational piece. Yeah, we started off uh, uh, creating, uh, uh, let's say, the prerequisite to create a core banking solution. And uh, it was uh, 2020, end of 2020, when we signed an agreement with uh, Google um, to, to create the two clouds nodes in Italy. The foundation was uh, there, and we needed to establish them because we have a data center in Turin. And uh, for something that uh, many of you know, latency, if you want to rebuild your uh, legacy core banking, you need uh, your legacy um, data center to be close to the cloud node. So we launched a tender. Um, everybody was participating to the tender. And at the end, uh, we choose uh, Google. And I would say it was price, it was understanding of our requirement as a systemic banking needs. So we have in Europe, we have regulatory, we need the cyber, we need the, uh, compliance and so on. But especially it was also a, a trust relation that was established uh, with Google, with Thomas Corian and so on. I would say that uh, somehow in this case, uh, trust is all you need uh, somehow. Um, the second step was then to um, understand how to uh, have a good business case to do the replatform once you create the foundation. And uh, therefore, we, we talked with uh, our CEO, we had a long discussion, and at the end, we established that uh, we wanted to create the foundation for a new bank, a new bank that has a different operating model and that can operate in a flexible way through channels. Uh, you know that uh, building a business case to redo the core banking is not easy, and we, uh, not easily, we, we build it at the end. Uh, the third st step, uh, therefore, was uh, uh, create a strong liaison with uh, the business, the commercial bank business. So we launched uh, a, a bank, a new startup bank, fully digital, that is called EasyBank. The underlying technology, we, we call it EasyTech. So that's... Yeah. Uh, the similarity. Uh, the EasyBank is, was launched in one year after the launch of the project. It's fully functioning and uh, it's working, I would say, as uh, uh, with a solution that uh, covers uh, all the everyday banking need. It covers, uh, let's say, the sum up of uh, uh, different fintech that you can find in the market. So we have a full offering and we are expanding it. 
the next step will be to bring all this technology to the uh, big bank, the legacy bank, meaning we are the fourth largest bank in terms of market cap in Europe, and we are the largest in Italy. Therefore, it's important for us uh, to have a reliable partner, and uh, after the journey that we should complete uh, by 2025, so we have uh, one year and a half uh, to go, we will have a full core banking platform uh, built uh, on uh, with new principle, meaning that uh, um, all the channels will be in an omni-channel solution. You can use the branch or other solution in a flexible way. Uh, it will enable a very different cost to income and uh, it will manage uh, a, a catalog of product uh, that is digital, meaning that uh, if you want to create a new bank, uh, you have to create it for the digital space. And the key point uh, is how you deliver your product to the customer so that they can be uh, used both uh, through the app, through the internet banking, call center, or branches in a seamless way, all the same product. And we believe that through this we will have uh, a very uh, important step in our efficiency and profitability. Yeah, that flexibility is, is really important as you think about the future and where things are going. Yeah. But no trivial feat to do what you're doing. Um, Shavolz, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of, first, we're really excited about the, the news release, the, the press release that we had you did yesterday, <laughs> uh, jointly with Discover um, and yourself. But do you want to talk a little bit about how you chose Google Cloud and kind of what the decision sure criteria was that you went through? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, uh, Zach, we had uh, a long partnership with Google solving all sorts of uh, customer problems uh, way back. Uh, with Google Cloud particularly, uh, we started in 2017 when we set out to build uh, Discover Digital Assistant. And, uh, you know, that's something that runs on Google Dialogflow. And uh, we worked with the Google Teams uh, to, to build, you know, to build that capability up that uh, at that time was really unique and solved a very specific customer need when you really just wanted to get things done, banking done through messaging. So we had a good track record with your product teams. And when about a year ago, generative AI started to surface, that was sort of the context on well, let's see what we can use potentially this one for and how we could move forward from here. But that's how the relationship started and that's how we started up with Google Cloud and that's how we got to the use cases that we had, uh, thank you, I think uh, a very good uh, use case and a very good uh, uh, release about just yesterday. Fantastic, well, we're gonna learn more about that in a moment. Um, so maybe back over here to Richard. When you think now that you've done all this foundational work, you've got this incredible digital bank and all of the kind of data that you now run in a 97.5, is that what you said? 96.4. 96.4, okay, sorry. Uh, percent cloud. Um, you know, what does that enable you to do? And how do you think about AI and what you're doing in that space? Um, now that you've got a lot of these foundational pieces in yeah, place. Yeah, and, and look, I, I think everybody in, in, in this room was probably doing some of the things below the glass, like GitHub Copilot and all those code assistants. So I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the things that we're attempting to do <coughs> above the glass, which uh, therefore uh, are impacting our customers directly. As you said, and as I said earlier, the we spend a great deal of time putting all of our data onto Google, all of our customer data. It sits in something we call customer intelligence engine. Um, but that asset then allows us to, to build on that for customers. So we've done a couple of things recently. So cash flow prediction. So clearly, if a, if, if a customer's got sufficient transactional volume with us, we can quite clearly give them a cash flow prediction uh, using AI. Uh, the second thing that we've launched quite recently is variable rate review. Um, so any mortgage customer in Australia who's a customer of Macquarie can ask using the mobile application um, for a rate review on their mortgage to see if the, their recent transactional history has therefore improved their overall 
uh, rating and therefore they can get a different uh, rating on their mortgage. So those things that we're beginning to build and, and by putting all of our data in the customer intelligence engine, it allows us to move quite quickly on that. Um, I've got my CTO in the crowd. We were talking um, last night as well about um, uh, the, uh, remember when you used to receive a statement and it was just a list of transactions, no context, nothing interesting for you, but the humble transaction has become really the, 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 the core of personalization for a customer. So with customer intelligence engine, clearly we, we allow customers to add a hashtag, uh, they can add photos, they can add a document, they can add a receipt. All of that is then available to them when they're looking at their transactional history. So that humble transaction has now become something that's got personalization and context. Um, so, yeah, that's what we, we're really focused on now. We're a digital-only uh, bank. Um, we have no branch infrastructure, and therefore our customer service and the digital services that we can offer our customers is, is our critical differentiation uh, in a very competitive market. Uh, to come back to Grace's point as well, but we do all of this as well with the human in the loop, right? It's really important as we productionize uh, these AI examples that we've managed risk appropriately. This is our business, of course. Trust is our business as a bank, and therefore we keep that uh, very much close. But yeah, I think they're the yeah. good examples of things above the glass, the things that customers can really touch and feel. Yeah. Well, it's, it's tax season here in the US, so having all of your transactions at your fingertips and being able to get to receipts quickly and all of that is That's super the, valuable. The number one hashtag is hashtag tax. <laughs> because if you hashtag your transactions, then you can do a natural language search on, hash, on that hashtag and you can do your tax return in a seconds. So I need, I need that. Um, that's fantastic. And the regulatory piece, I think, you know, we'll hear that as we go, but the, you know, as we all know in financial services, the bar is a lot higher around explainability, model governance, all of those things. So maybe Grace, you could kind of talk a little bit about your journey now around the stuff you're doing with this fantastic data platform that you've built, some of the AI work that you're doing, some of the use cases that you've been able to kind of implement. Yeah, so I mean, we've been doing AI a long time. Uh, as I say often, and I apologize for repeating myself, but AI has been around since 1956. Uh, and we are an industry that relies on data. Uh, so we have hundreds of models already deployed and productionalized across the bank. Yeah. Um, what, is, what is really almost criminal is how much of our data scientist time we waste. Uh, so the real benefit to me for having all of this data in the cloud is that we can take these talented people and make them so much more productive and fulfilled because they're not spending 80% of their time chasing down data. Uh, they can do some really cool new stuff because PII is enabled in the cloud, and so they can take a bunch of unstructured data, which typically can contain PII, so we've been relatively cautious now. We can enable them to use a lot of this data to do many of the things that Richard mentioned uh, to serve our customers and make sure that uh, you know, we are delivering on the promise of uh, personalized services. Um, but what's really interesting about Gen AI, and I, it's been exhausting. Uh, as an <laughs> analytics person or an AI person uh, this last year uh, because there's not one conversation. If you have a group of five or more people, you will talk about Gen AI and they will talk about how it would better cook your burger uh, or something like that. Uh, but um, what's been really cool for me in Gen AI, aside from, you know, it does have some really true good benefits, is that it's actually solved one of the core problems that we have in data, which is business ownership of data quality. Anybody who is a data professional in this room knows how challenging that is to get them to care, to own it. Um, and Gen AI, because it is so easy for people to access, it's very accessible as a technology, it has a GUI, children are using it. Um, it means that people are excited, you don't have to have a PhD to participate in AI. And so an, a use case that we did recently uh, was a very typical one. Put Gen AI on top of your knowledge base, uh, and have it uh, retrieve uh, much more contextual answers for our contact center agents. Our, our quality answer, I think, was at 33% in our first go-round. Um, it is now at around 96. 
And the reason why that happened is not because AI got better. It's because the contact center team actually went into their knowledge base, added a context to acronyms, uh, updated uh, titles, updated content, got rid of old content, removed incorrect content. And they did it all on their own. Very, very excited to do it, too. This would have been a $10 million, 12-month consulting engagement. To any consultants in the room, we're really sorry that we, we took your business. Uh, but uh, it's, they, they did it themselves. They were excited to do it. Uh, they did it within months. Uh, so that culture change of owning data quality and participating in analytics is massively, massively important. And I think that's going to be the difference. It's not that the AI is that much better, even if it is. It's that the people participating in it and activating it for the business are, are stepping up and really, really enjoying doing it. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that AI, I said 100 or more, actually hundreds of models deployed. It, it takes 18 months to build each one of those. Uh, and they are not particularly scalable. They're usually for you know, thousands of customers, not millions. And uh, they don't really stitch together. So there's no flywheel. Uh, to each one of those. They're points of light or stars in the system, uh, but we haven't connected it into a constellation yet. So we're not seeing the scale benefits. Uh, so the thing that I think will be very good for us going forward, and I know that the regulatory pressure that we're under is significant, is it does make the business case for a platform better. Uh, because if we want to demonstrate that we have monitoring, that uh, managing drift, that we have a catalog, that we've gone through validation, that we have it documented. The platform's actually really great for that. And it also enables scale, reusability, and all these other things that make it so that uh, you know, we're, not, we're not doing one good thing at a time. We can do many. Yeah, the platform piece is huge. Once you, you get to a certain critical mass, you realize like, it's, it's so important. Otherwise, you waste so much time. The data wrangling, I was cracking up when you said that, because looking back at my earlier days as an analyst, you'd spend 80% of your time wrangling data and, uh, and doing, you know, the fun stuff was just on the margin. So yeah, I'm looking at three of them now. Yeah, so <laughs> that was very, yeah, very near and dear to my heart. And the, the data ownership piece is so important because, you know, the old adage, garbage in, garbage out, right? And this makes it very real, right? The feedback loop was very real for the, in your, your example, the call center, they were seeing like, oh, this is a wrong response. Well, why is it a wrong response? They're going to see in the actual information, oh, it's actually wrong in the information, so we should fix it, uh, which, is, which is fantastic. Massimo, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you're thinking about AI and the, the journey you're on there. Yeah. So uh, we started the journey a couple of years ago, even more, uh, let's say, with, uh, uh, till two years ago, we were basically exploiting AI. Uh, recently, basically, we uh, are running AI at a scale. We have an objective by 2025 to produce 500 million bottom line benefit in euros. And we have a structured uh, process to, uh, let's say, prioritize the use cases. Uh, we will have, uh, let's say, 25% uh, uh, that coming from cost reduction, 25 <coughs> from risk reduction, and 50% from uh, revenue increase. That's more or less the, uh, the, the split uh, of the revenue. We are running many use cases, uh, um, conversational platform, uh, uh, let's say, on uh, building efficiency, on uh, uh, liquidity forecasting, uh, and uh, so forth. Um, to ensure that this program doesn't derail, however, we created principle and infrastructure to guide this, uh, this, uh, this journey that we are doing. And uh, uh, because uh, this was done before the AI Act, for the ones that are in Europe, they know what, uh, what I'm talking about. <clears throat> and uh, uh, basically, we create a four principle. Each AI uh, use case should have uh, explainability, uh, fairness, human in the loop, and the quality uh, uh, of data. Um, I agree with uh, what Grace was saying, uh, basically, that uh, quality of data is the key point. And through this, uh, uh, through this program and uh, showing, basically, the benefit that you can have out of the, the AI program, we ensure also commitment from the user in terms of uh, data governance, uh, data quality, and, uh, of course, the work is not done. We are progressing but in uh, the right direction. All this uh, is uh, considering Gen AI aside. Gen AI uh, will come on top of this, 
and uh, as uh, basically everybody, we are doing many use cases, uh, are not just pilot, are also in production. Uh, but uh, I recall what uh, Thomas Gurian said a few days ago, yesterday, I guess, uh, and basically that you have to prepare for that. You have to prepare because the uh, impact of uh, Gen AI on the process of the bank can be important. You have to rethink all your skill base, your process, and so on. And uh, therefore, uh, we are not uh, yet uh, scaling it because we have to ensure that uh, um, we do it properly, considering all the possible uh, consequences of this. Uh, then, of course, uh, things like uh, uh, call center and so on are done, are there, and we are progressing. Uh, but we believe that uh, uh, GenAI can have a, a much wider implication on the bank's operation. Mm. Yeah, I definitely think that the it's early days in, in the sort of regulated space, but um, it's huge potential that, you're, that we're all recognizing. So maybe we could, you know, also we could get into your specific, some of the use cases that you have put into production and, and love to learn a little bit more about how that's working and what some of the learnings have been as you've done that process. Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, Zach, one of the, uh, just starting with the brand, one of the key pillars of the Discover brand is the award-winning customer service, customer experience. It's a great customer experience, leads to loyalty of your customers. So as, as, as specifically generative AI emerged, that was one of the use cases that we started to look at. There are plenty of uh, subtle issues with customer experience. There are plenty of subtleties that could be done significantly better, and how do we do that? So. Actually, the beginning of the journey is very similar to Grace, what you said, and, and Massimo, what you described. Uh, with, a, with, a, with a regulated industry, specifically with banks, uh, we worked on the organization first. So we built, uh, we call it a generative AI console. Uh, essentially, this is to build an organizational framework to evaluate risk. So um, it, uh, it has uh, participants from legal, compliance, uh, information security, analytics, uh, engineering, and the business lines. And the primary idea is to get the organization more comfortable with the boundaries and establish some no regret rules, mm. like we don't let employees use just open tools at leisure, but we can build you know, uh, enterprise uh, capabilities with the proper security, but also we create an intake for ideas and experimentation and we build a risk framework that helps to start into this space with uh, you know, the least risky or the least uh, disruptive use cases. And those are the ones that we, we put into production. So some of the specifics. So if you guys think about uh, what digital banking did to customer service, a lot of great things. Everything is at your fingertip. It's in the app. Uh, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an, in your web browser account center. What it did for customer service, though, for agents, for the humans, it made their job significantly more difficult. You just don't call anymore, or most of us don't call anymore <coughs> if you want to know simply your balance or you want to know your payment due date. That's at your fingertip. Uh, what's been happening is really only the difficult questions end up with your customer service agents. And, you know, your customer service agents are or are bearing the complexity of the industry on themselves. And the way it manifests just very practically is that, you know, when you decide to call and you want to have a human to help you, the agent actually has to go through a lot of material. So agents have procedures that they have to follow, specific procedures on how to execute any particular step. And as, you know, as the conversations get really complex, the primary challenge that we found that's in place of an awesome customer experience is simply to find the right procedure. Again, if it's an easy question, chances are it's done digitally. It's a difficult question what comes to the call center. So what can happen, Zach, is when you call, you know, you may hear that, oh great, I understand, Zach. Can I put you on hold for a minute? Yeah. And that's the least thing that you want to hear. And it's just very difficult because what happens in the background, the agent is going to start to search for documents. In a traditional search, they find documents. Those are many pages long. They have multiple documents and they don't get to the information. So generative AI with summarization provides a very intriguing, 
potential solution here. And that's what we, we sat down with the, uh, the Google product teams as well to see how could we put this in place and how could we evaluate this as a use case. And it's, it's, it's a fascinating journey. The, uh, it's very different from your usual platform development because you know, we are Google Cloud customers, so Vertex AI is integrated. Gemini is integrated into Vertex. So the actual coding part, the traditional engineering part, is measured in weeks. It's, it's a very, very quick process. On the other hand, to tune the models to the point that they can actually summarize the information that's relevant to your procedures, that is really the heavy lifting. And that took quite a bit of an experimentation. We go skill group by skill group. So we take procedures that are similar. Uh, really the, uh, the most important people that we find now is the knowledge workers. It's expert agents, the technical writers who write the documents themselves. They are the ones to help us uh, run cycles to tune the answers that we put in front of the agents. And you know, it, um, it helps with the agent adoptions. The, the agents who get the answers, they get a thumbs up, thumbs down uh, for basic feedback. And they give qualitative feedback on which are those questions where the answers are getting higher quality and which are those where it's lower, so human in the loop, evaluation of the output. Uh, we did a lot of, uh, the team actually did a great job, both the, uh, the Discovery and the Google team, to build automated tools to rely on our core domain knowledge with golden answers and what the AI can produce and how we approximate what is an awesome answer versus what is a not good answer. So it's an, it's an, it's an ongoing uh, refinement cycle that actually has been very practical. Uh, let me give you just maybe one other one because the, the actual intro use case was even simpler than this. You know, another solution could have been, well, if the agents have to find all of those procedures and then those are many pages long and then they have to read it, well, why don't we just write the procedures so they would be easier to follow? And if you are thinking about that maybe Gen AI could be a good tool for that, we had the same thought ourselves. So, so the first use case that we really tried was, okay, can we give generative AI to assist the technical writers to rewrite the procedures? Because in those use cases, we have the basic framework uh, in place that we don't change. So the technical writer uses generative AI it is really helpful, but then once you are done and created the procedure, it goes through the same legal review by a human attorney, and then it goes through the same uh, compliance review, a human compliance officer, as a traditional procedure would have gone through that so no assistance from generative AI. So, so we started to pull these use cases on top of each other, and again, the generative, the AI console is, is, is super, super valuable because they help to create a risk scaling for us. So we can go after very specific customer problems and we can try to find solutions that are measurable and measurably change the customer outcome. So uh, this, is, this is what we, uh, what we put into the uh, to the, to the joint article that we released that uh, in this way, we actually could put this in production with actual agents. And what the team focused on uh, primarily is the amount of time that it takes for an agent to get to the information. Uh, as the team usually points it out, the agent's idea never is to find a document. They wanna find a solution, the summary. So long story short, what we found is that with the new platform, uh, we cut the search time by about 70%. And that's with real agents on real questions that they face with customers. And, you know, 70% is 70%. Uh, this is a better context. The original one, the search time usually was measured in minutes on a phone call, minutes or forever. Yeah. That's unbearably long. The new solution is measured in seconds. So the, the, the agent can stay in the conversation flow, they can provide answer. You know, we use RAG, so the, the data is 
directly tuned with our documents. There is direct link built to the document. So as the agent gets the summary, they have the direct link to the referencing document, by the way, which is a much more accurate search than the historical one was. So the agent can drop into the relevant document. In fact, it can find the right spot within the document just by clicking. So it's, it's, a, it's a better tool. Now, again, uh, scaling is an effort. You go skill by skill, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a skill worker kind of challenge as compared to an engineering challenge. And, and you know, scaling the risk framework and staying within your acceptable risk boundaries. But we do see uh, a good number of use cases that we lined up. We had the console scale or, or, or rate, and now we are you know, working through, and some of it we are moving into production. That's fantastic. And I think um, something, a, a theme that came up throughout is this engaging across different groups. So bringing the risk teams in, bringing the business in, obviously technology at the table, like having that partnership from the get-go is really, really important. Um, so that was, that's wonderful to hear. And really great example of actually getting the core reps to be the one sort of rating how effective the answers are and, and, and reinforcing the learning that way, which is, is fantastic to hear.